We're here at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., looking at John Copley's Watson and the Shark. Now, this is, this is a real-life event that he was commissioned to paint about uh, a man who was taking a swim in the harbor and was attacked by a shark. But, as with all art, there is a deeper meaning in it. Let's dive in. There's, there's just so much meaning behind everything that they do with their physical gestures. As H.W. Uh, Jansen points out, the shark becomes a monstrous embodiment of evil. The man with the boat hook recalls an archangel, Michael, fighting Satan. And the nude youth resembling a fallen gladiator flounders hopelessly between the forces of doom and salvation. Although this piece is very, very spiritual, it is not religious as we've seen in past historical paintings where It'd be about Mary or, you know, what she has done to... Like a central heroic figure. Exactly. It's not... The, the central heroic figure is not a biblical figure. It's a, it's a real person. This is more about the victimization rather than a hero. It's depicting not a, not a holy or spiritual figure, but this is sort of a realistic in a way that's showing humanity against death. Exactly. So in, nature. in that way, it is almost spiritual, not in a religious sense, but... In the, in the sense of humanity, of our spiritual connection to each other, and our spiritual connection of the beyond. While this does draw from a real-life event, there are things about it that was manipulated by the artist in his rendition of the story. It's his interpretation of the story. With that interpretation comes the question of, is this real? Or is this unreal? A reviewer in the General Advertiser of April 28, 1778 criticized the artist for the futile way the rope is handled. The rope is wrapped around his arm and is connected to the boat. Hmm. So why didn't they utilize this rope? Why didn't they use that to save him? Maybe it's a representation of like how humanity behaves. Maybe it behaves in a dumb way. Exactly. Sometimes we take the longer route around what needs to happen how can we solve something? When we have the obvious problem solver in front of us, we don't utilize it. Instead, we find a more difficult way. It's almost a representation of our lack of connection mm -hmm. with the way we solve our problems with each other. That thing which we see is real mm -hmm. because it's manipulated. Does that make it unreal? Well, it's still real in the sense that it's maintaining the same figure, but when you, they alter it, it's... It is changing. It's definitely open to interpretation. It changes the mood and the emotion with the alteration. So in a way, he's affecting what we feel. He's affecting what we see as reality. On to Paris. Here we are in the Louvre looking at Theodore Gericault's Raft of the Medusa. This is an enormous painting, 16 feet by 23 feet. Can you can't imagine this placed in your bedroom? Mm. Oh yes. So according to a Leisure and Arts article in the Wall Street Journal, Theodore Gericault was inspired by a story he read in an article about a, a raft of people surviving. The ship hit a reef and sunk, and the captain took all the life rafts and left all these crew members to fend for themselves, and they built a makeshift raft. So we see all these people in despair. It's very interesting that this is a piece about man against nature just like Copley's watching the shark was. This specific moment is of the survivors having just sighted the ship all the way in the background. Mm -hmm. You can see the men waving trying to flag down the ship. It's almost their salvation. It's almost their savior. In a way they are... They the men are, are suspended between salvation and death by the raging waves. And the ship, the ship in the background it is their hope. Well on the foreground you have all this despair so these people have already given up. These people are dying. They have no hope, while the people in the background are the ones still seeking salvation. It's very mm -hmm. spiritual. The sky and water are definitely romantic in nature. They also depict drama, shadow and light, and convey the strong forces that humans are often at the mercy of. Now, Gary Colt spent a year working on the sky and ocean. The vastness of the sea is almost a barrier between them and, and hope. The Gary Colt showed this at a salon in 1819 entitled it a shipwreck scene, perhaps to avoid the political aspects. In a way, he's altering the, the reality of the story. He's making us question what is real, even in the, the colors and in the contrasts. It's very unreal. 
This painting is very interesting as, in a way, it's architecture, but it's not architecture. In the way that it's architecture is that it has triangles. As you can see, the front right dead body forms a diagonal line that which goes up through to the sail. And another diagonal line is from the bottom left body, which runs all the way up to the top to the man waving. So you have these diagonal lines in this painting. It connects all the people within it, and it connects them together. It almost puts a frame around them, a frame within a frame. Very beautiful composition. Theodore Gericault, according to Art History by Marilyn Stockstead, said that for several months, according to his biographer, his studio was a kind of morgue. He kept cadavers there until they were half decomposed and insisted in working in this atmosphere, I suppose to kind of indulge himself and surround himself by these decaying bodies to try to depict them correctly on this painting. It's very interesting. There's a quaintness and surrealness and calmness of water, yet at the same time it can be so devastating and it can be a portal to death. Mm -hmm. It can be our despair. It's very interesting. Both have the water in it. Almost like the sublime where we cannot control nature, where Nature still owns us.